Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you all for waking up early and coming to this first panel. Uh, my name is Gabriel Solis. I'll start by saying that I, this is my first Petra Kucha talk, and I actually did not follow the rules, so I apologize for that. <clears throat> so I want to talk briefly this morning about a project that I've been working on for several years and just rejoined the project this year. Uh, the project is called Texas After Violence Project, and uh, we are a human rights and restorative justice project that studies the effects of different forms of violence. We're particularly interested in murder and the death penalty, and we study the effects of violence on individuals, families, and communities. <clears throat> Our mission is to build a digital archive of oral histories and other historical materials that serve as resources for both community dialogue and public policy to promote nonviolent ways to both prevent and respond to violence. Since we started our project in 2007, we've documented several hundred hours of oral history uh, interviews. The interviews range from a topic of narrators, from people, from family members of people who've been executed to murder victim survivors, uh, prosecutors, capital defense attorneys and habeas attorneys, judges, jurors, <clears throat> investigators, just kind of a wide range of people who are involved in the long capital punishment process. And it's really quite a collection. I've, in a second, I'll come down and just scroll, scroll, scroll through our digital archive. Through a partnership with UT Libraries, a lot of these stories are publicly available uh, through the Human Rights Documentation Initiative. And uh, I, think it's, I think it's interesting that we are able to add our stories, which, which mostly focus on Texas within a wider international collection of organizations doing human rights work. So let me just step down real quickly and scroll through the, the archive. We're in the process of adding a whole other group of stories that um, with, with, there's a long consent process, which I won't go into, but sometimes it takes years to get the, the stories from when we actually conduct them to when we can actually share them publicly uh, online. So this is our site here, and just to show you how great this tool is, I'll just click on one of them. So you get the video of the interview and then the transcript runs right alongside of it. And then there's all these other uh, metadata that we're also updating as well. So you can see, you know, we ba basically break up the interviews into certain topics. And then you can even search by, by location or by, by individuals or topics mentioned in the interview. So they're actually a really interesting resource. And yesterday, it was interesting when I was here listening to some of the panels, um, hearing some of the panelists talk about the effects that the, the long process has on people, whether it's the, the victim survivors or the, the family members of the defendant, even the prosecutors and the defense attorneys are talking about the kind of effects that it has on them. And so this, this is precisely something that our project is trying to document. So uh, I'd encourage you all to, to check out our website and to scroll through the digital archive. And like I said, we're in a process right now. In the next probably six months, we'll be adding several uh, new interviews to the archive. So we do have time for a few questions for Gabe if y'all want to hear any more or give him thoughts or ideas. So I can bring if anyone has or we've got a smaller group so you might be able to hear each other. I was also going to say if you have any questions you can find. I'll be here yeah. most of today and some of tomorrow. Also, um, visit our website, or if you want to share your story or think you know someone who might want to share their story, uh, let me know. Great. I mean, we have a little bit of extra if you want to show a brief clip of any. Sure. I don't know if there's one that's, that's a, yeah. a quickie that we can do, but then we can we could try that.
After, after doing that, in 1978, many prisoners who were self-educated in the legal system, uh, they call them writ writers, were making complaints and sending them to Judge William Wayne Justice. And so Judge Justice decided to consolidate their complaints into one class action suit against the Texas prison system called Ruiz, that was the one of the writ writers, David Ruiz, uh, versus Estelle. And uh, Mr. Estelle was the chair of the board of directors of the prison system. So this class action suit began in 1978, but Back. Da question about data about uh, data about the impacts. You know, so what we haven't done a great job yet is um, asking educators and researchers and advocates how they use our archive. And so we just launched a new website last night, uh, partly be in preparation for uh, this conference. My colleague Walter Long is going to be speaking tomorrow as well about the project. And so on our new website, we built in a form asking the public or educators or, or people who are using the archive to just let us know how they're using it. Um, we've collaborated with educators um, in the past few years who've used the archive in very creative ways in their course courses and in their lesson plans, um, but I would like to know more about how people use that. I was actually reading an article not that long ago and uh, went to the, f went to the um, footnotes and saw that the, the, the author had, had um, cited one of our interviews. So we're always happy to see people using it. I would, we, as an organization, we'd like to know more about how, how they are doing that. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right. Next up, we've got, in, um, here, I'll do this. Who wants to pick it? Um, no, it's Will and Sam Sotomayor. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Lila Silverstein. I'm an appellate public defender from what some of you might call the other Washington. We just call it Washington. Washington is a very liberal state in many respects, but when it comes to fairness in the criminal justice system, we have one of the worst records in the country. And I just wanted to update you all on what's going on up in our neck of the woods. With respect to the death penalty, the problems identified in Furman existed in Washington no less than everywhere else. First of all, the death penalty was imposed randomly on a small subset of the worst offenders. And secondly, to the extent the imposition of the death penalty was not random, it was racially biased. So how did our state respond? Well, our legislature tried to fix these problems. We actually have some of the strongest statutory safeguards in the country at each of these stages. And in Gregg, the court said that if states truly limited eligibility for the death penalty to the worst of the worst and narrow discretion at each step, then there wouldn't be room for arbitrary decision making and there wouldn't be room for the play of racial prejudices. So that's what we tried to do. In Washington, capital punishment is available only for the crime of aggravated murder. The problem is that the number of aggravating circumstances has increased over the years, and they've been interpreted really broadly. Now, at the selection stage, Washington permits the death penalty only when there are not sufficient mitigating circumstances to merit leniency. And at trial, 
the jury must find the absence of sufficient mitigating circumstances unanimously and beyond a reasonable doubt. So that sounds pretty protective. But the problem at this stage is that mitigating circumstances can, of course, be just about anything, including this rather vague concept of mercy. So what ends up happening is that mercy is both afforded and withheld in an arbitrary and racially biased manner. But the hope was that this would work. And then, notwithstanding Pulley versus Harris, we do have mandatory proportionality review in Washington, which the court in Gregg seemed to think was important and which you would think would provide an additional layer of protection against arbitrary and racially biased decision making. But in practice, our Supreme Court has never reversed a death sentence under this provision. So the bottom line is that these post-Furman fixes did not work in Washington. We've had about 300 adults convicted of aggravated murder. Only five have been executed. Only nine are on death row. Those 14 are not the worst of the worst. This is something our governor recognized two years ago in imposing a moratorium. That's our governor. And just to explain it a little more, a few of those people on Washington's death row committed aggravated murder against a single victim. But 97 adults committed aggravated murder against multiple victims and are serving life sentences. And it's not as if those murders were quick and painless. Unfortunately, most of them involved extreme cruelty and unspeakable victim suffering, yet those defendants are serving life sentences while a handful of others are on death row. And our governor's not the only one who's recognized that unfairness 10 years ago. Justice Johnson of our state Supreme Court, Court wrote for four dissenters in saying he would have held that Washington's death penalty is unconstitutionally arbitrary. Three and a half years ago, Justice Fairhurst said the same thing in writing for three dissenters in a case called State versus Davis. Also in Davis, Justice Wiggins wrote his own dissent. He said he agreed with Justice Fairhurst that the death penalty is imposed randomly and arbitrarily, but he also said it appears that African-American defendants are more likely to receive the death penalty than Caucasian defendants, and we should study whether that disparity is statistically significant. Right after that opinion came out, a colleague and I were appointed to represent Alan Gregory on appeal. Mr. Gregory was sentenced to death for the aggravated murder of one white woman in Pierce County, Washington. He was only 24 at the time of the crime, and his only prior felony was theft of a skateboard when he was 13 years old. And meanwhile, scores of other defendants with violent felony histories plus an aggravated murder are serving life sentences. So one of the first things we did was to answer Justice Wiggins' call to action and commission a statistical study of Washington's aggravated murder cases. That study was performed by Professor Catherine Beckett and grad student Heather Evans at the University of Washington. The data set they used was the same data set our Supreme Court uses in performing proportionality review. Trial judges who are presumptively neutral arbiters fill out reports at the end of each aggravated murder case, and those reports constitute the data set. The regression analysis controlled for case characteristics that are supposed to matter. These case characteristics are reflected in the trial reports. Um, and what the regression analysis showed is that most of the variation in sentencing cannot be explained by relevant case characteristics. And it showed that in Washington, African Americans are four and a half times more likely to be sentenced to death than other defendants after controlling for those case characteristics that are supposed to matter. And that's obviously untenable. We have had 40 years to fix these problems. We've utterly failed, and it's time to call it. So we have asked our state Supreme Court to strike down Washington's death penalty scheme under the Eighth Amendment and under our more protective state constitution. That's a picture of our state constitution over there. <laughs> um, so we'll see what they do. Um, and if you want more information, I've provided links to the statistical study and the oral argument in Gregory, which occurred just last month. If these links aren't in your materials, you can always email me if you're, if you're interested in them. And you can email me with any questions if you want to know what's going on up in our neck of the woods. Or ask me right now.
be able, um, but while, while I'm walking to you, I can also say that we will take pains to put any of the speaker's PowerPoints on the conference website when we're done, so folks can just. My only question was the slide of the variables that were controlled for. I wasn't writing quickly enough. So the variables are the number of victims, the number of aggravators, the number of mitigators, the criminal history, and what's the last one? Um, so there's a field in the trial reports, and those weren't the only ones that okay. were controlled for. That's just a, those are just examples of some of them. Um, but the other thing that was up there was whether the judge indicated there was substantial victim suffering. And that was found to have no effect, um, presumably because so many of these cases involved substantial victim suffering. Yes. Oh, sorry. What's the procedural posture of the appeal? Are you already at the state Supreme Court? Yes, yeah, so we just argued this case um, on February 25th. And in, in Washington, the way it works is in capital cases, unlike other cases, arguments are four hours. They essentially last all day. It's two hours per side as opposed to 20 minutes per side. Um, and our court does take a strong interest in these cases, even though they've never reversed for a disproportionate sentence. Um, the, what happened is the state at every stage has, has fought the court on this report. They have, they've moved to strike it. That motion was denied. They said you shouldn't consider it. They didn't come back with their own contrary study or anything like that, even though they had a really long time to do that. We didn't, never objected to their motions for extensions of time because we wanted them to have time to, to, do, to challenge this and to consider this important issue, but they didn't come back with anything else. They just told our court, don't look at this. Um, so the court was, was not happy with that, but they also challenged us a lot about the study because of course we commissioned it. And even though we kept saying, you know, that the researchers use conventional methodologies and with every decision that had to be made, they erred on the side of disproving the hypothesis, um, the court, the, you know, the court wants to know for sure that they're going to be able to rely on a re reliable study. So they actually issued this order. Can you hand this to me? Um, thank you. So just a couple weeks ago, we got an order saying, um, before oral argument, the state moved to strike the report, and this court denied the motion. At oral argument, the state requested an opportunity to challenge the report, even though they'd already had 13 months. Um, sorry, little editorial comment. <laughs> a majority of the court determined to allow the state the opportunity to challenge the report. Now, therefore, it is ordered a hearing shall be held before Supreme Court Commissioner Pierce on an expedited basis upon the party's completion of the following. And then what they say is that both parties are supposed to submit proposals for how the Supreme Court Commissioner is to conduct a hearing. Is it written interrogatories? Is it a full-blown hearing? Should the court appoint its own independent expert, et cetera? So this is really unusual. Um, we've never, nobody has ever seen an order like this from our Supreme Court, um, but the proposals are due in a couple of weeks, so that's where it is. You can do this one, pick one more. And then. I, uh, thank you, and congratulations on a masterful piece of scholarship and litigation. Uh, I have a question about the role of the ACLU. I know early ACLU was involved in trying to get some funding, but I don't know if they ultimately were involved. And if they were involved, whether or not that, whether or not some people then accused the study of being biased. So the ACLU did submit an amicus brief, um, just a, a standard amicus brief, and, and it was also signed by 56 retired judges in our state who agree that the death penalty should be struck down. The ACLU did not have anything to do with the study. Um, and, and also, Jeff Robinson um, spoke for 15 minutes. We gave him 15 minutes of our oral argument time, and he did a wonderful job. So they didn't have anything to do with the study specifically, but they were heavily involved as amici, and, and you know, um, sorry. It says stop, and I'm, I'm a rule follower because I'm an appellate attorney. Uh, so, um, but I'd be happy to discuss it more with you. Thank you very much. Have 
Good morning. Good morning. Great conference. I'm Dick Dieter I'm with the Death Penalty Information Center, and I want to talk about a report I recently did for the Center on Veterans and the Death Penalty. Uh, veterans, as this slide, whoops, the one that's just going too fast here. <laughs> Let's get back to the as this uh, slide indicates, are receiving much more respect than they did, say, in the Vietnam era when they were coming back and often uh, criticized for participating in the war. Now we recognize the, the value of veterans. We honor them at sports events. We honor them at the airport. But when it comes to the death penalty, there seems to be a disconnect. And that's what this report is about, telling some of the stories uh, of, of p vets who have been executed or who are on death row. You probably have heard the story of uh, Manny Babbitt, uh, who was one of only 13 people who've been executed in California. You know, it's got to be the worst of the worst. But of course, uh, ah, sorry. I don't think I'm clicking, but got a lot of energy. <laughs> uh, Manny Babbitt served in Vietnam in one of the worst places in Quezon, and he was responsible for picking up dead bodies and you know, helicoptering out the wounded. He was awarded a Purple Heart, and when he got back from Vietnam, he had a series of, of PTSD and mental problems. A murder was committed. Uh, his brother, Bill, recognized that you know, Manny might have been the person who did it because he had a cigarette lighter, I think, from the, from the victim and turned his brother in with the uh, uh, assurances that this wouldn't be a death penalty case. But in fact, uh, you know, it went through the system. Uh, Manny was executed in the gas chamber in 1999. Governor Gray Davis, uh, also a Vietnam vet, had the opportunity to commute him, said, well, you know, a lot of people have been through a lot of trauma. Uh, that's no excuse for, for what happened here, sort of that amnesia that uh, Mike Meltzer talked about, you know, the, the death penalty illness, so to speak. Um, and, and so his case stands, stands for that. But that was 1999, and maybe we've, we've learned a lot. Well, this is a case of a man who was executed, Andrew Brannon, last year. The first person executed was uh, a Vietnam vet who uh, suffered so, so badly from PTSD that he had 100% disability from the Veterans Administration. The crime was, you know, he was stopped by the police for a traffic violation. Uh, all of a sudden, he, he started to get agitated because his, his, his mental problems were emerging. Uh, and he took a, the, 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 you know, he, he just couldn't cooperate with the police and took a gun out of his truck and, and shot the police officer. It was the only kind of bizarre uh, incident like that. But, you know, he was executed in Georgia despite all of that, despite the, you know, the newfound respect that we have for, for veterans. It, it's somehow just not getting through. Sometimes it even involves innocent uh, defendants. We all know Leonel Herrera from the case of uh, Herrera in 1993 that was decided by the Supreme Court uh, on, on other issues. But it turns out, you know, Leonel Herrera was also a, a veteran, a Vietnam vet. His mo mother describes, you know, what it was like when he came back from the war, the PTSD he suffered. I mean, obviously, if you're making an innocence claim, you don't want to say, and if I, <laughs> if you don't believe that, well, the reason that I might have done it was, was mental illness and PTSD. But, you know, Kirk Bloodsworth, Marine, Ray Crone, uh, Air Force uh, in, in the war, all, and, and many others have been exonerated. Not that veterans are to be treated differently just because they're veterans, but this is a bigger problem. I was completely surprised when I started investigating this issue and found that military people just didn't know how many veterans have been executed, how many veterans are on death row. What's being especially done about their cases? And it's at the federal level, too. This is Lewis Jones. Only three people have been executed on the federal level in the modern day. Lewis Jones, uh, again, he was in the Gulf War with the whole chemicals that were released there in the, 
Gulf War syndrome and other PTSD was executed by the federal government. Uh, others remain on death row. Robert Fisher in Pennsylvania, there he is getting his, his purple heart from the president. Later, you know, he gets the death penalty and he still uh, could face execution uh, despite that. Uh, here you have uh, James Davis on death row right now in North Carolina. Uh, oops, got a little jump there. <laughs> it doesn't want to give you that slide. <laughs> uh, he's getting his, his, his medals uh, for his service and he remains in a kind of mental Ill, Ill this state of uh, volunteering for execution. Um, th these are very sad cases and, and ought to be given more attention. Uh, the Supreme Court did give it some attention in, in, in Porter versus McCollum uh, and, and you know unanimously overturned his death sentence, a Korean War veteran. Uh, of course they had to find a, a legal reason, ineffectiveness of counsel. But uh, you know, still, I don't think that, the, that this is completely done, not just on prosecutors and governors, but on defense attorneys, who, that th this has got to be uh, more closely recognized. As many as 80% of, of people coming back from Vietnam uh, 20 years later had symptoms of PTSD. And of course, Iraq and Afghanistan vets, you know, huge numbers uh, of, of people are affected by this. Uh, and, and it needs to be brought out at trial, it needs to be presented even before it gets to trial that this shouldn't be a death penalty case. These are the kinds of things that people with PTSD have been through, uh, you know, witnessing the remains of dead bodies and actually carrying out killings and causing the deaths of others. Uh, that's what leaves them uh, in such a way. And of course this is connected, I think, thank you, <laughs> with, <laughs> I should really shut up. It's connected to the broader issue of mental illness because people on, on death row for, who are not veterans also had childhoods of sexual abuse, of poverty, of violence all around them. And once we, we don't know how many of those there are either. I mean, that I think is, is part of the problem here that there's this great unknown about veterans, great unknown about mental illness. And maybe if we uh, address this problem with with veterans as a sympathetic group, we could more broadly address some of the problems with mental illness. Thank you. So yeah, we should definitely grab a copy of the DPIC report that Dick wrote. It's out in the information tables. Anyone have questions for Dick? All right. Richard, uh, to, to the extent you have an intuition, I, I take it you don't have any hard data. When defense counsel really plays this, do, is it effective? Well, there's a hesitation to do it because it conjures up maybe somebody who is a future danger, somebody who has got an illness that, uh, you know, is uh, gonna be a problem all through their lives. So I, I, I can, I've talked to defense attorneys and they say sometimes we know it and we don't use it as, as strongly uh, as we could. Um, you know, I, I think when, it, when a case gets late in the day, appeals and clemency, there's they're sort of this machinery that, that keeps going. I'm not sure why it's not more effective to stop this. Another veteran was executed this year, another veteran was almost executed the other night. Uh, so I, I think it needs to, what Mexico, which has citizens uh, Mexican citizens in the U.S. on their death rows, what they do is get involved pre-trial and make presentations to the prosecutor and, and you know, provide translation and all that cultural stuff and prevent the case from going to the death, to, to, to trial on a capital level. And I think that's where the emphasis needs to be. Sympathy could be, be garnered that there's enough. And I, I think we're, we don't know, you know, how much success and how much failure there is because I think there's about 10% of people on death row have uh, our vets, but we don't know how, exactly how much more there could have been, et cetera, et cetera. Is there any, here I am, is there any pattern to homicides by veterans? Is it always with guns? Is it always impulsive? Is it, it always? It, it, you know, I wouldn't say always, but yes. I mean, the, the, the cases that I looked at are, are bizarre. Uh, people, they didn't know or 
uh, family members uh, with whom they're having very difficult relationships. It's, it's not the, uh, always the case of, you know, the murder for, for profit somehow, sort of murder for gain. It, it, it's sort of the violence that breaks out either in a family or, you know, Lewis Jones, the federal case, he goes on to a military base and abducts a woman and, and, and rapes and kills her out of the blue. I mean, sort of, it doesn't make any sense, some of these crimes. Um, Andrew Brannan, you know, you don't get that angry to shoot a police officer just be over a traffic stop, but he did. He had been living in a tent. He, he had years of mental illness, so it, it, it springs out of something. I mean, I don't think PTSD is the whole answer, but uh, the, the crimes are often very unusual. Thank you, Dick. want to see if it switches. Okay. All right. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Laura Schaefer, and I'm with the Death Penalty Due Process Review Project also, and I am working on our new Capital Clemency Resource Initiative, which I have lots to say about, but not a lot of time, so I encourage you maybe afterwards, if you have questions about it, to talk to me, and I have learned from some of you already, so thank you to everyone here who has over the past several months taking time to speak to me about clemency as we sort of learn about this, learn about this important aspect of a capital case. But what I want to do in this presentation is take a little bit of a step back from what we're thinking about in terms of our clemency work now and look at what has happened with clemency in the last, I'm actually gonna start about 300, <laughs> 300 to 400 years ago, sort of go through the historical, historical aspects. So, as many of you already know, but just to sort of summarize for those who may not be familiar, forms of clemency um, can come in different, different manners. You have the possibility of a pardon, which is basically the equivalent of undoing a sentence. Um, in capital cases, what we're thinking about typically is a commutation, which would be a lessening of a sentence. So in a capital case, from a death sentence to a sentence of life without parole. And also what we see in acts of clemency currently are the exercise of reprieves, uh, what Lila was talking about in terms of Washington and other states where the executives have issued reprieves or issued moratoria halting the practice of executions. And when I talk about clemency now, I'm going to be talking about it specifically within the context of capital cases. I know we've been hearing a lot about the clemency power under Obama currently for nonviolent offenders, et cetera, but that's not what I'm focusing on. So I'm taking us back to William Blackstone, who was one of the first to start thinking about clemency in terms of its significance in the common law. So here we have 1769, Blackstone talking about how significant the power of clemency is in a monarchical system. And he is actually speaking about clemency in the monarchy as something that's necessary to generate loyalty between the monarch and the citizens of a state, as something that helps to generate fealty, and as something that is an important aspect of, of what I would call mercy to understand as running alongside what the imposition of, of the criminal law is. But what's also interesting is that Blackstone, when he talks about clemency, then goes on to say that if one were to have a perfect legislative model, a legislative system that worked entirely on its own without a monarch, without a prince, you wouldn't necessarily want the clemency power because to him it would make no sense to have the same institution that created the laws to have the power to abrogate the laws. So he wanted to see only, he, he saw the significance of clemency in a system where you did have someone like a king, like an executive who had this role. So then bringing it to the colonies, uh, we have a few, a few years later, a decade later, we have Hamilton talking also about the significance of clemency. So even though Blackstone is talking about clemency in the terms of the monarchy, and obviously here we're a little bit after we repudiated the 
monarchy, the founders are still thinking that clemency is a significant aspect of any criminal justice system, something that is necessary to consider to be able to exercise mercy and seeing that even if a criminal sentence is appropriately carried out as far as the letter of the law, that doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't room for someone at the last stage of review to reach a different decision or to exercise mercy or to decide that in a particular circumstance, even if guilt isn't at issue, that other factors may mitigate against the punishment that could have been, that would have been appropriate for guilt. So, and there's some, some great quotes from, <laughs> from the founders on clemency, I must say. So then we're taking us, we're leaping a couple hundred years forward into the modern era. So I was learning also as I was researching this that the idea, the very word of sovereignty in Latin, the power of life over death, that this idea to be able to exercise mercy is something that we contemplate actually within our notion of sovereignty itself. But when we think about capital clemency now in the modern the modern era, what we're usually thinking about are these famous instances of governors, executives issuing these mass grants. That's where we see the clemency power being exercised and most famously in the last 20 years was in Illinois when Governor Ryan first issued a moratorium, then commuted the row of 100 some, 100 some individuals on death row prior to the legislature then abolishing the death penalty in Illinois. But here again, the the rationale is somewhat different and he already starts to inject in this quote, you can see we must ensure the public safety of our citizens, but in doing so we must ensure that the ends of justice are served. That it was interesting because I, can, I think you can see a little bit the importation of politics now in his explanation of this, that he has to acknowledge that there are gonna be public safety concerns that come or that people will voice this, the public safety concern. And this isn't something that goes into the more conceptual thinking about clemency that Blackstone, that Hamilton talk about, they don't feel the need to justify it in this way, but when the actor is justifying it, they need to talk about this. So one <laughs> thing that I wanna focus on now is the fact that we've actually seen a pretty significant change in the rate of individual commutations from before Furman, before Gregg, to the modern era of the death penalty, so the 40 years after Gregg. So, Research shows that in the first half of the 20th century, and I tried to get the data to actually find if I could do 40 years prior to Greg, but the data on individual commutations just doesn't exist for every state, so I have to <laughs> sort of go with the, the first half of the 20th century to represent the time period. So the first half of the 20th century, one out of every four to five sentences was commuted, this gave us a clemency rate of about 20 to 25%, which if you practice now, you know is pretty extraordinary compared to what people are looking at today. If you look at commutations after 1976, um, I think actually now we're at 1,432 with the execution last night, but from mass grants, we have 213 acts of clemency. From individual grants, we only have 67. So a very small number and which puts the rate of individual commutations in the last 40 years at about 4%. So the question is what happened in the last 40 years that so significantly changed the exercise of the clemency power? So I have a few theories that I would posit. The first one is actually that Greg, when it came back, allayed the fears of the executive that the death penalty was too arbitrary, was too harsh, and they now felt that the role that they had to serve prior to Furman was no longer necessitated by their actions in commuting sentences, that the, that the statutes were constitutional, the death penalty was being applied appropriately, there wasn't a role for the executive to step in. In addition, you have the cases after Greg that are coming up for clemency, let's say the 10, 15 years after 1976, coinciding with what we heard about yesterday in terms of the fear and high murder rates and sort of paranoia about crime that occurred in the 1980s and 90s. In addition, you have some particularly famous cases of acts of mercy or in Willie Horton's case a furlough kind of going wrong and being used in a political context to show that the politicians you're electing can't keep you safe and so it became seen as politically non-viable to exercise mercy. So you have a confluence of Greg and this other factor. So <laughs> I 
would like to posit at the end of this that not all hope is necessarily lost because I think in the same way that you had two factors together with Greg and then tough on crime that reduced the rate of clemencies, what you have now is new interest in mass incarceration and the problems of, um, of criminal, uh, criminal justice reform being something that we're thinking about and we're also having reconsideration of the death penalty. So this might be a moment in putting these two things together where we can start advocating for clemency again as a real tool to stop executions. And talk to me more about my project. <laughs> I don't have time to go into it now, but thank you. Well, we certainly do have hope that the work that Laura is doing can maybe help improve the quality of, of clemency. But anybody have, kept, we have time for a couple of quick questions for Laura. Does anyone have questions? All right. Oh, I've got one. Maybe just a quick uh, comment, and I, I don't know if it's a question, but for, for those of you who haven't seen the state reports that Laura and her colleagues have been working on, I really urge you to look at them. Uh, we've done a lot of clemency work in Arizona, almost uniformly. Uh, unsuccessfully, but we, we, we learned things that we had not even thought about when we looked at, at the report that, that they did on, on our state, and I assume that the others are, are equally as detailed and in-depth, so we really appreciate it. Thank you. files on all the clemencies between 1972 and 1990 on file at the National Death Penalty Archives at SUNY Albany. Great. Yeah, it was the sort of the, the 1900 to 1972 I could find for some states, but otherwise I just found a rate, but that's good to know to, to dig through there. Well, and if I remember correctly, when we finished this capitalclemency.org resource in the summer and we're, pu we're putting together materials we've gotten from members of the community, um, we are actually going to try to do some of those with search terms, with, with relevant tags so people can find them based on issues. So I believe Laura and some of her interns and volunteers are working on that right now. So hopefully make that a usable in another way, too. Well, thank you. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.